Let us pray. Lord Jesus, the only begotten Son of the living God, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, you did not only descend from heaven for our sakes and for our salvation to become a man like we are, but in order that the salvation you brought from heaven might be given to all men, you have also commanded that it be preached to everyone. Praise and thanks be to you today and in all eternity for your inexpressible love. Lord Jesus, we also beseech you that this preaching may not be in vain for any of us. Open our blinded eyes that we perceive the wisdom of your counsel for our salvation. Guard us also against being satisfied with merely hearing the preaching with a passing joyous wonderment only, but help, oh, help us, Lord Jesus, that whatever is preached to us may fall like light and fire from heaven deep into our heart and kindle there the light of true faith and the fire of ardent love. Amen. Amen. Beloved brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. Now, if we have started uh, in a way that's a little different than, uh, for example, Dr. Scare did, um, there's a reason for that. Uh, not only because if we're talking about people that, it, that it's tough to follow, one of them would be Dr. Scare. You can't do that. Uh, my my, my stand-up routine is uh, substantially uh, different from his. Um, but also because, more importantly, what we're doing right now and for the next 45 minutes is, in a sense, to model what a sermon of CFW Walter might look like. Now, with some uh, substantial differences, it's not really a sermon, it's not a proclamation of law and gospel, it's talking about preaching. But we've begun in very much the way that CFW Walter would typically begin a sermon. First of all, with a prayer that would be directed toward the theme of his message for the day, then with a salutation as we just did. Uh, from that, Walther would very typically then introduce the topic, the subject, to be addressed in the sermon, uh, raising some kind of issue that needed to be addressed, uh, some kind of challenge, some kind of uh, topic to be discussed. And then, if Walther happened to be preaching as a guest somewhere, instead of in one of the four congregations that he served simultaneously in St. Louis for very many years, then he would also step aside for just a moment informally to greet and thank the congregation for having him. So let's do that. Um, in absentia, it's a, a delight to, to thank uh, Reverend Ollendorf uh, for uh, being host along with Salem Lutheran Church, uh, also uh, Mount Olive Lutheran Church for being our, our, uh, our place to, to gather today. Uh, a, a real delight and a, a reason to thank uh, the other uh, colleagues on, on the agenda today. Uh, Dr. Feuerhahn has been uh, someone that I have uh, admired uh, from a distance sometimes of a few hundred miles. Uh, but every time I get to see him in person, that's, that's always a delight. Uh, uh, Dr. Veith, I met for the first time a number of years ago uh, when we were speakers together at a, a free conference down in Plano, Texas. And uh, more recently, I've had the, the great joy of being the uh, faculty advisor to his brand new son-in-law. Always a delight to get together with Dr. Veith. And Dr. Scare, I mean, we, I, I, I always thank him. Uh, it, it, very few days go by when you can't think of something along the line to, uh, to recognize from, from one of those many courses that did sound a lot like the last hour. Uh, I, I remember, for example, as, uh, as uh, Pastor Olson alluded, you know, you, you take a course on, on baptism with uh, Dr. Scare, and, and now I, I didn't say this, but uh, oh, about eight weeks into the 10 weeks, uh, a bolder fellow student than I raised his hand and said, uh, Dr. Scare, you know, it seems like uh, we're, you know, more than three quarters of the way through the course and uh, the course is on baptism. And the one that we haven't talked about the whole time is, now we did a great job with the Gospel of Matthew. <laughs> 
No question about that. And uh, so for, uh, for those and other, uh, other reasons, it's a delight to, to thank Dr. Scare as well. Um, overall, let me just say it's a delight to get to be here with all of you. Uh, the, the folks who put this on know how to put on a classy event, uh, up to and including uh, starting at 11 o'clock in the morning. I mean, it's hard, hard to beat that. You do these things ordinarily, and, and you got to be uh, ship shape and, and on at uh, 8 o'clock. Now, I doubt that Walther in a sermon would thank the host congregation for having their service at 11 o'clock instead of at 9 o'clock. I think he probably was a good, good German who was uh, ready to preach uh, at, uh, from the word go. But uh, for me, it's been uh, really rather, rather quite nice. Then, Dr. Walther, after uh, greeting folks, if it was in fact a guest situation, would move on to the, the topic at hand. And so, let's talk about that for just a moment. Uh, Yes, you'll notice that the topic at hand is, is uh, uh, clearly identified, and that's very Waltherian as well, if I may. Uh, when I got the invitation uh, to speak, Pastor Ollendorf uh, asked me, obviously in the broad topic of the Office of the Ministry, uh, Dr. C.F.W. Walther's insights on what makes a sermon a Lutheran sermon. Okay? Obviously, in that topic, there are at least two assumptions. Number one, that there is such a thing as a Lutheran sermon. And secondly, that uh, Dr. C.F.W. Walther has some insights for what that would be. On the first point, whether or not there really is such a thing as a Lutheran sermon, I would say, oh, oh yes. In fact, my, my uh, PhD is, is from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. And one of the more interesting and provocative topics that we addressed in one of the courses was the denominational sermon. And of course, I had plenty of Baptist friends who would frame a description of what a Baptist sermon would be like. And we looked at all kinds of uh, different uh, uh, denominational traditions. And and uh, the question of, uh, of whether there was such a thing as a Lutheran sermon was, of course, addressed to me. Um, I tell my students, and I make them not only write this down, but we say it out loud together, that the genre of the Lutheran sermon today is a 20-minute plus or minus proclamation of law and gospel within a liturgical context. Now, will you say that with me, please? Let's try it again. Here we go. The genre of the Lutheran sermon today is a 20-minute, plus or minus, proclamation of law and gospel within a liturgical context. Now, that was poor, folks. That was poor. We'll try it again. All right, ready? You got it all from me, and you got to do it yourself. Ready? Is a... That was much better. By the end of the 10-week quarter, you'll say it like professionals. So, yeah, I believe there definitely is such a thing as a Lutheran sermon. And then secondly, the question whether Dr. Walther has some insights to contribute to what that would be. I think already from what we've just said in, the, in, in my working definition and what all of you know about Dr. Walther's other areas, like 39 evening lectures of great fame, he must indeed have something to say about uh, what it is that makes a, a, a sermon a Lutheran sermon. The fact of the matter is, we could really address this topic uh, rather extensively and, and pretty successfully by just seeing what Walther says about sermons by doing nothing other than examining the proper distinction between law and gospel as Walther has described it. We could do that. Uh, for our time together today, I would instead, though, really like to examine what it is that he contributes from the preaching itself. Now, we'll talk about what he says about preaching, too. But we want to look at some of his preaching, uh, the actual sermons, and see how we uh, see examples of what uh, a Lutheran preacher might be doing from Walther's own corpus of, of uh, available sermons. In 1897, on the 10th anniversary of Walther's death, A.R. Brummel, in an uh, essay entitled Walther the Preacher, said this. He said, Walther is a model preacher in the Lutheran church. If that's so, then we should definitely be able to find things in Walther's preaching itself that would be helpful insights for us as to what a Lutheran sermon might look like. Now, all of that is by way of introduction, as Walther would introduce his sermons. 
The point of Walther's introduction was always to bring us to the statement of a clear theme. Okay? When he would finally summarize what the sermon is going to be about. And I think we're ready for a theme right now. I think we're there. I would say that CFW Walther's preaching does give us plenty of insights for what a Lutheran sermon looks like because... And if this were printed out in the way that the German manuscripts of Walther's sermons would print it, it would be like you've got on your handout in bold face. Okay? You can read it with me. C.F.W. Walther, you don't have to read this one out loud with me unless you want to. C.F.W. Walther is a classic Lutheran preacher of law and gospel. Now, after Walther has begun with prayer, salutation, introduced the subject, and announced his theme... Then he would always introduce the parts, or in homiletical parlance, we'd say the major divisions, or we'd even say the Roman numerals of the sermon. Notice, Dr. Scare, you're a lot more entertaining, but this is more Waltherian. <laughs> Two major divisions in this uh, afternoon's presentation as well. Number one. And you can see these have Roman numerals on the, on the front side, and then on, the, on page two, you can see where we're going to go with this. Walther is a classic Lutheran preacher. And number two, see that in the page two? Easy to follow along. Walther is a Lutheran preacher of law and gospel. We will look at that theme together in the time that we have this afternoon, uh, examining above all else Walther's own preaching, as well as, of course, as I said, some of the things that he says about preaching. The available material on Walther's preaching comes primarily from seven collected volumes. There are also many sermons that are out there individually or a couple of them at a time in, in pamphlet form. But the, the seven volumes that have come down to us uh, make up the, the bulk of the available Walther material. Um, it, during Walther's lifetime was published, first of all, uh, a volume of um, 69 sermons on the gospel texts uh, in 1870. In um, 1882, 87 sermons on the epistle texts. And then also during uh, Walther's lifetime, uh, still in uh, 1876, Lutherische Brosamen, which means Lutheran crumbs, was another collection of sermons that was published. Uh, that was a total of uh, 87, oh, I'm sorry, 59 sermons. Uh, the first two, the epistles and the gospels, are both available in translation. The Brosamen, uh, the crumbs, is actually, to my knowledge, not, uh, not translated fully, although uh, some sermons from it uh, have been translated. The, the crumbs are on various texts for uh, Sundays of the church here and also occasions. Um, Walther died, of course, in, in 1887, and in the several years, very shortly after Walther's death, four other volumes came out of his uh, collected sermons as well. In 1891, there was a, a book called uh, Gnadenjahr, or A Year of Grace. That was another 65 sermons on the Gospels. Uh, in 1892, uh, a volume of occasional sermons and addresses. So those would be, you know, ordination sermons and uh, uh, confirmation day sermons and, and, and things like that. And they cover actually quite a variety of, of different occasions. Uh, 97 such sermons in that volume. And that is also translated. Uh, Year of Grace and, and Occasional are both translated. Then there are two other volumes that came out uh, shortly after Walther's death that are not, uh, to my knowledge, available in translation, uh, Festklänge, uh, which means like festival chimes. Um, and uh, that was uh, in 1892. That's approximately 50 uh, festival texts. And uh, Lichten uh, des Lebens, uh, Light of the Living, another 68 on the Gospels in 1905. Again, that probably is not available in translation. All of that adds up to approximately 500 German sermons that are readily available to us today, uh, and about 320 of those uh, from these collections then are uh, in uh, translation in English. Uh, for the purpose of our examination, I looked at many, many of those in, in uh, according to certain criteria, 25 to 30 of them very specifically for the particular uh, criteria uh, that we will uh, look at together this afternoon. It's a lot of material to work with and, and gives a pretty nice feel for, for Walther's preaching. So, to the first portion.
my uh, assumption or my, my, my claim in, in the first part of our presentation is that Walther is a classic Lutheran preacher. I readily admit that this first portion could be uh, referred to as observations that only a homiletician could love because there's a little bit of uh, homiletical theory here. Um, but we would say in general, in our first portion, that Walther definitely stands in the classic Lutheran homiletical tradition. Uh, some of that actually is more than just the classic Lutheran tradition. A lot of what we'll say in this first portion simply describes Walther as being very much a classic preacher of not only his day, not only of the 19th century, but also of a very, very lengthy history of Christian preaching, well outside uh, just Lutheran uh, preaching. And uh, uh, in these cases, he's just a classic preacher who happens to be Lutheran. Um, in other areas, he is definitely an example of what Lutherans have classically done in their preaching. And in those cases, we would say that what, what Walther is doing in his preaching is descriptive of what classic Lutheran preaching looks like, okay? What Lutheran preachers have done the last several centuries. And then there are also some cases where I'd say it's really, what, what Walther does is really prescriptive for what makes a sermon uniquely a Lutheran sermon. When I say prescriptive, you know what I mean? I mean, if it's going to be a Lutheran sermon, it probably is going to do these particular things. And there are certainly some of the characteristics that Walther demonstrates in his preaching that I would say is that. I mean, if it's really going to be a Lutheran sermon, it's going to do those things. So in each of these ways, we'd say that Walther is a, a classic Lutheran preacher. Uh, you notice that both with the first major division, that first handout, and on the second side as well, I've got six uh, specific subdivisions, also very Waltherian to identify the, the, the carefully identify the substructure as well. And uh, we won't necessarily have time for a lot of examples on each one. We'll see how our, our 45 or so minutes go, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll skip some if necessary, but uh, we, we will uh, draw upon some uh, many examples from Walther's preaching as we go. Let's start by talking, as Walther is a classic Lutheran preacher, about his sermonic process, his preaching process. Uh, Walther was ordained in 1837 and died, of course, 50 years later in 1887. For the, the large majority of those 50 years, he was basically an every Sunday preacher. Um, I mentioned before, he was simultaneously the pastor of four different congregations in St. Louis, which meant that he was very, very busy with his Sunday mornings. He also was a guest all over the place and all the time. So there are many, many additional sermons uh, among those, those occasional sermons that I referred to where he would be asked to preach for uh, the opening of the synodical convention or for the dedication of a, of a church building and other location, all those kinds of things. Um, a, a, a safe estimate would say that his Sunday morning preaching in total was between 2,000 and 3,000 sermons, and then many, many more for occasional. Again, we have about 500 of them readily available. So again, it's a, a lengthy uh, uh, history of preaching and many examples along the way. Um, as Walther describes his own preaching process, he says this, first of all, that the, the process begins right away at the beginning of the week. He says, if you wait until Wednesday or Thursday with looking up the pericope for the coming Sunday, and after a superficial reading, decide on some topic which will yield you eight pages of manuscript, sufficient for a talk of, anybody know how many minutes? More than 20. That's the Lutheran, that's the genre of Lutheran sermon today. But you learned your lesson well. Good job. Anybody else guess? 45. Um, Luther, 60 minutes. Luther complained that Bugenhagen, his pastor, was too long because Bugenhagen preached two hours. So it had gone from, you know, two hours being long in Luther's day, but one hour being about right in Luther's day, now to the 1800s, 45 minutes. Okay? And, you know, it's come down substantially since then. If you wait till Wednesday or Thursday to look up the pericope to find a text and an idea a subject from that'll give you 45 minutes, Walther says, you act like 
an abominable hireling. A faithful pastor begins on Sunday evening to consider the subject of his sermon for the coming Sunday. Quick poll. We were asked before how many of us are reformed. How many of us start on Sunday evening? Wednesday, an abominable hireling. Okay, Walter would say, start early. I do stress that when I teach homiletics. Now, I usually say Monday, but you know, it's a more laid back kind of era now than it was in Walter's day. Walter would then, from that study of the text, be very careful to develop a particular point that he wanted to, to, to speak on. We call it homiletically our theme, which would always be for a particular purpose. And this was uh, something that was very important to him. He would uh, write out a full manuscript of the sermon by hand. Uh, the, the typewriter was invented in uh, 1814. Uh, the modern typewriter, 1868, came on the market with Remington in 1873. So the last few years of Walther's life, uh, typewriters were available. But uh, Walther, uh, to the end, uh, speaks of, of uh, using the pen, and he did write out a, a, a full manuscript. And this, that is actually helpful to us. Uh, perhaps you know the sermons that we have of Luther's, and we have about 2,300 of Luther's sermons actually available. Um, how did we get those in writing? Anybody know? Exactly. Uh, Luther, for the most part, did not write a full manuscript. So what we have from Luther would be transcriptions of from his hearers, who, you know, in those days actually wrote shorthand, that kind of thing. That also is the way we have Walther's lectures on law and gospel. You perhaps know that. Uh, he did not write full manuscripts for that. So those are transcriptions uh, by hearers. But his sermons, he always wrote out. And so what we have in the, the German manuscripts really are uh, specifically Walther's words. And Walther even says uh, in the, the prologue to one of his collections when he, he was still living that he did not want to alter anything from what he had actually preached uh, live and in person. Then, a very important part of Walther's preaching process, not only to begin his sermons, but throughout the week, was prayer. He says this, In a moment of inattention, when a preacher is not on his guard and does not pray while he is writing his sermon, God may permit him to rely on his own strength in order to make him see the sorry results which he has achieved without prayer. Every one of your sermons must be the product of heartfelt prayer. When you sit down to the task of writing your sermon and feel that you are distracted, cold, and dead, you must not think, that cannot be helped, I must fill this page. No, lay your pen down. Call earnestly upon the Father in heaven to lift you out of your miserable state of mind, to give you a fervent heart, to overcome everything in you that is not godly, to let the breath of his Holy Spirit enter your heart. And then, after all that work is done prayerfully, then Walter says, and this is in, in Law and Gospel, he says, you should subject your manuscript to severe critique, which is to say, don't finish on uh, Sunday morning or even late Saturday night, but early enough in the week that you can actually go over it and, and uh, be very precise in your choice of words. His discussion there in that context in Law and Gospel really is about the, the necessity of precise use of language. Delivery. Walther, very much a classic man of his day, speaks of word-for-word -word memorizing of sermons, which was very much the style in those days. And he warns against the, the dangers of extemporizing, again, because uh, the, the, the words one chooses might not be precise. But he does also say, and he says, he, he's all, almost offering this as kind of a concession. He says, but I, I'm, I'm, even, I'm even going to say that a preacher needs eventually to be free of his manuscript. In other words, a more free kind of delivery. And this is actually interesting when you look at Walther's sermons. Um, Walther's sermons, how long did I say? 45, 45 minutes, okay. Uh, how long do you suppose Walther's written sermons average, Sunday morning sermons? Any guess? 4,500 words. 100 words per minute, okay. Now, if, if, if you're a, you know, if you, if you teach homiletics, which means you study this kind of jazz, you'd say that that is a very, very deliberate preaching pace. 
Okay, not much more than a word per second. And it doesn't mean that your rate of words is just a, a second, a second, a little over a second, a little less than a second, a little a second. But it means that his pausing, what I call, t teach my students as processing time, is very substantial. Now, what that really tells us is that Walther took seriously his last words of comment about being free of the manuscript, not because a preacher adds additional words necessarily, but a reading pace is invariably much faster than a speaking pace. Because when you're reading, once you finish a, uh, this is all homily, like only a homiletician could love, you know, Justin remembers me teaching them this, you know. If you're reading, as soon as you've finished a particular word, your task is done and you're ready for the next word. But if you're speaking live and in person, you may, you know it may not be time for the Next word, just yet. See? And so what it really tells us is that Walther was probably, even as elegant, formal, and intentionally precise as he was both in the structuring of his sermons and the wording of his sermons, nevertheless, very likely, a, a rather free, and I would guess even rather lively, presence in the pulpit. And that's, uh, that's my inference from, from at least those statistics. Walther's preaching process. I would say there's a lot here on which Lutheran preachers could indeed model their sermon processes as well. Prayer, conscientious labor, whether it's starting on Sunday or Monday, or at least not Saturday. Um, very meaningful organization that leads intro to a theme and so on. Um, care to very precise expression and also that, that free delivery. But you'd also have to say that while these are, are definitely insights that can be helpful to a Lutheran preacher, they are also very much in the broad classic homiletical tradition. These are not uniquely Lutheran things. These are uh, the very sorts of things that uh, preachers of, uh, of other denominations, if also careful and conscientious, probably would, would follow. Secondly, Walther's sermon form. Almost without exception, Walther's sermons follow very closely uh, what is called a traditional deductive sermon form. Uh, deductive form basically means that you introduce a subject and early in the sermon announce in summary what the thing is going to be about. Okay, then in classic deductive form, you also very carefully divide the parts, just like we've modeled here. And, and I teach lots of alternatives to this. For example, like an inductive sermon form is kind of the opposite, where you don't get to the summary until the end. And there are countless other forms. Walther's sermons are almost without exception this deductive form. Uh, that prayer that we talked about, the introduction, the theme that is clearly stated up front, this is what it's going to be about. And then also, I, with the only exceptions being in some of his occasional sermons, wedding sermons and such, he will then also actually very mechanically announce the parts. He'll say, we're going to talk about this theme under two major divisions or three major divisions, and he will announce those uh, as well. Uh, for example, in a sermon uh, for the 10th Sunday after Trinity, 1847, uh, in the gospel just read, the Son of God announces temporal and eternal misfortune to the citizens of Jerusalem, but with tears of pity. This permits me to present to you this truth. God does not desire the death of any sinner, even though so many perish eternally. And again, the published form, that's always bold face. And then he goes on to say, in this connection, we will answer two questions. Number one, does God really not desire the death of any sinner? And number two, how is it possible that so many nevertheless die eternally? And then even as the sermon goes on, you get to a break point between the first and second major division. Uh, after he answers that first question about God really desiring the death of the sinner, he says, yet, beloved, if it is really true that God does not desire the death of any sinner, how is it possible that so many nevertheless die eternally? Let me now, in the second place, speak to you about that. Okay? Um, this is the, very much the classic, uh, tell them what you're going to say, and then 
Exactly, see? And that prevails among us in, in, in many settings uh, to the present day. Not only is it very uh, kind of classic in, in, in all kinds of sales presentations, court cases, and so on, but it's also the, and for about 1,400 years, the unchallenged, almost, uh, sermon form in Christendom, going back to the time of Augustine. Uh, you have, uh, you have uh, uh, Aquinas doing this in, in the uh, 13th century, just uh, you know, to such amazing precision, it's almost bothersome. Um, Luther, in his pericopal sermons, his sermons on the lessons of the day, same way, um, you go back and look at uh, Walter A. Meyer's Lutheran Hour sermons, same way. Dr. Gerhard Ajo, my first homage professor, same way. And uh, Dr. Fikentcher teaches his students this first as a, kind of the most classic uh, homiletical uh, tradition. Now, uh, while that is classic homiletical tradition and also classic Lutheran, preaching, it is a little, a little interesting because um, Luther actually gave us a form which is different from this. Luther is recognized by all Christian uh, historians of preaching as being the guy who developed the expository sermon, which is a variety of forms, but it, the point is it follows the movement of the text, not necessarily a nice even two-part, three-part sort of thing. So, I mean, Luther doesn't always do it this way. In his Sunday morning on uh, text, uh, sermons on the text, he does. But when he goes through books of the Bible, uh, he does it that way instead. And it's also true that Lutherans today are very much on the cutting edge of, of uh, creative variety in sermon forms. And I'm not, you know, talking about, you know, just guys that we know so much, but uh, H. Grady Davis, uh, he, old uh, LCA guy, Richard Jensen, Edwin Steinle, uh, Morris Needenthal are really big names in, in uh, homiletical uh, discussions today. No, they're all all Lutheran, and their uh, contributions are a variety of sermon forms. But this is also very classic. Next, Walther's preaching as liturgical. Um, remember my definition again is a 20-minute plus or minus proclamation of law and gospel within a liturgical context. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and this, I think, really is essentially prescriptive for what a Lutheran sermon is. I think if a sermon is going to be a Lutheran sermon, it really is one that is compatible to a liturgical setting or a liturgical context. Um, the, the chief characteristic, above all else, in, in a liturgical sermon is the use of the assigned pericopes, the assigned lessons for the day. Walther was very much a lectionary preacher. Remember I mentioned to you before that three of those seven volumes of his were specifically on the Gospels of the day, one of them specifically on the epistles of the day. Um, the other, two of the other volumes were actually for chosen Sundays of the, or other times the church year, and only one of them, the occasional CERN volume, had um, basically free texts where he would just choose the text. The interesting point to be made there is when it wasn't one of the lessons for the day, that was specifically identified. In the, in the volume on occasional sermons, here's the idea. Okay, guys, remember, these are just occasional sermons, so they're free texts. But pretty much all the rest of the time, it's going to be one of the assigned lessons uh, for, for the day. And I think that's uh, very classically Lutheran. Uh, if you remember it all from, from uh, homiletical history of uh, Reformation, Zwingli made quite a point of breaking with preaching on the assigned lessons. And Luther did also preach through books of the Bible at other services, but the Sunday mornings were on the lessons of the day. And so this is very classic uh, Lutheran. Um, uh, in uh, the introduction to that volume, Year of Grace, that 1890 collection of, of, uh, of uh, Walther, the editor says this, uh, it is the Lutheran church which seeks to lead her members above all into the depths of the understanding of divine truth instead of superficially covering many subjects. Therefore, in order to be able to reach this goal the better, unlike the Reformed, the Lutheran church had retained the gospels and epistles selected by the old church for all the Sundays of the church here. And as a rule, 
are expounded on the Sundays, year in and year out, instead of letting it up to the preacher to choose texts according to his discretion. That's very much a, uh, almost, a, almost a requirement to, to be at least classically uh, Lutheran in the homiletical tradition. Um, a couple other liturgical elements that we'll just touch on very quickly. One, uh, you know that 20 minute thing, plus or minus? Um, that of course has changed through the years. Walther was 45 minutes. But you know what gives us the 20 minutes today? The liturgical setting. I mean, their reason, their, yes, it's true that the back end of the liturgical day is set by other things. But the idea is we've still got an hour or an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes if you got Holy Communion. But our expectation is that that hour or hour and 20 or whatever like that is going to include a full liturgy. Walther stayed the same way. For him it was 45 minutes because the, the total package was bigger. But the idea is that length is also actually determined by fitting the sermon into a liturgical context. And, and Walther was very sensitive to this. Uh, you notice, for example, his Sunday morning sermons are substantially longer than his um, uh, you know, Thursday night Ascension Day service, you know, or, or uh, other off days. Um, what do you suppose is the longest of the sermons that, that I found in my discussion? What, what, what day, what occasion? Easter, 8,300 words. At 100 words a minute, 83 minutes. Uh, on the other hand, his uh, occasional sermons were more like 30 minutes, with one exception. You, you want, want to guess one, one uh, occasion, or, or it's really a minor festival, it's a pretty big minor festival, um, where his sermon wasn't so short, and his Reformation. His Reformation sermons are often quite long, like 50 minutes, and that, that's unusual. Uh, but the idea is that it, it's packaged within the liturgical context. And then one more element of the liturgical setting, which is huge, and that is Walther's use of hymns. Uh, this, this, of course, is very Lutheran. We understand Luther's understanding and appreciation of what hymns do as real teaching elements. And Walther's sermons use them extensively. Well over half the sermons that I looked at used at least one and often two, uh, used in a variety of ways, sometimes in another kind of uh, common older Lutheran tradition as a conclusion. You know, the end of the sermon concludes with a hymn stanza. Uh, very often it's uh, um, uh, in the middle somewhere just as illustrative. And then a couple of times, a Christmas sermon and Easter sermon, he actually had them sing a hymn stanza during the sermon. He'd say, now we'll continue as soon as we've hung, sung a hymn. So that was a very uh, important part of of his understanding, and that certainly is part of what is classically Lutheran uh, in preaching. Uh, one more of these I want to touch on in, in full, then we'll have to skip a little bit for time, and that's the very next one, Walther's use of the scripture in preaching. Um, Walther almost always used a text. Very rarely would he preach a topical sermon where he'd have the idea that he'd want to talk about, and then he'd find lots of passages of scripture, although he used many passages in all of them. But um, Henry Eggold, who translates Walther's selected sermons in, in a volume uh, that CPH put out uh, a number of years ago, has this in his uh, introduction. He says, Walther's sermons are more goal-centered, goal-centered, like, you know, soccer, goal, uh, than text-centered. The text suggests the theme for Walther, but from that moment on, the theme is the master of the sermon. His major divisions are taken from the theme, but not necessarily from the text. As a result, Walther has some sermons that are quite textual and others which use the text only as a point of departure. Um, just to kind of explain what, what, what Eggold is talking about there, um, he'd say, Walther looks at the whole, let's say, let's say the, the, the lesson is eight verses long. Walther would look at those eight verses and he'd figure out what's the point point of those whole eight verses. Okay, that's the point. So that's going to be the theme. But it may be that that text develops that theme with, let's say, verses one through three being a plot step, you know, let's say a narrative, a story text. And then verses four through six are another plot step, and verses seven through eight are another plot step. And by the time you get through verse eight, you've gotten through the whole story, you've got that point. Well, Walther's sermons often, they, they have that point, that's the theme, but then not too often, well, eh, more often than you think. Uh, Eggold's point is that more often than not, the major divisions won't be Roman number one, the first plot step, 
Roman numeral two, the second plot step, Roman numeral three, the third plot step. But instead, he'll just take the total eight verses, take the theme, and just how do I want to attack that theme separately, okay? Now, Walther would not object to this assessment, I think. He says, let me urge upon you in a general way, he says, this is advice to preachers, to take a survey of the pericopes on which you're going to preach and to note beforehand particular passages that suggest subjects to you on which you feel you ought to preach. And you notice what he's saying there, that the subject the text is about is kind of more important than following the text per se. Or even says this, and this is uh, in the introduction to his volume on the Gospels while he was still living. He said, the purpose of the editor of this volume should not be to choose those sermons which best follow the rules, nor even those which conform best to the text, but those which show most clearly the manner in which the counsel of God for our salvation is proclaimed to our beloved hearers. How law and gospel, grace and works, repentance, faith, and sanctification is preached. So he says, you know, don't worry so much about conforming to the text per se, be sure that law and gospel, Christ, salvation are proclaimed from that text. Um, Walther definitely has a, a goal in mind. The fact of the matter is, in, in the sermons that I looked at, um, uh, just a little over half of them, you would agree with Egold definitely that they uh, did not move according to the text. All, just under half, though, were really pretty, pretty much following the order of the text. This is actually also an interesting kind of comment on what Lutheran preaching is like because, as I mentioned before, it was Luther that developed the concept of the expository sermon. That is, the sermon which follows the movement of the text. And so what Walther does here is, uh, is actually a, a kind of a, a, of a break from that. But it's not quite as clear a break as one would think because what Luther did in his expository sermons, and by the way, how many of you heard the term expository sermon nowadays? Right? Okay. When you hear it nowadays, it very often is synonymous with uh, what is done in a lot of uh, churches, other, really other than Lutheran churches for the most part, uh, where you kind of go 30 or 45 minutes verse by verse by verse by verse through the text. Okay, now I actually call that neo-expository, which is always kind of a pejorative uh, way to say it, you know, because what happens there is verse one, here's a, here's a, a verse and let's have an application. Here's verse two, and let's have an application and so on. That's not really what Luther did in his expository. Luther really looked at those whole eight verses let's say, eight verse per be. And he figured out what we call the Herzpunkt, or the sin mitte, the main idea, or the, the heart point. And then he went verse by verse developing that one point. Now that's not too far really from what Walther does. It's a little different. But the point that's in common, and I think this is very characteristic of classic Lutheran preaching, is that you really seek to develop the point, the point of the whole text. The reason for that is because uh, cutting a text into little segments uh, has as its chief um, victim or casualty, Christ. When you look at sufficient context of scripture, the point, as Dr. Scare said very well before, the point is always Christ. If you take a verse by itself, you might see it as nothing more than here's something that Daniel did, do like Daniel. Here's something that David shouldn't have done, don't do like David. But stepping back enough, the point is always Christ. And so Walther does that very much in common also uh, with Luther. Just the last couple of items on the, the first portion I'll just allude to very quickly. Walther's use of rhetoric in preaching. Uh, rhetoric actually includes a whole lot of things that are very classic, even going back to Greek and Roman tradition. Um, but when we think of rhetoric, among those things is the use of, of very lively, flowery language. And, and I could give you examples of that. I, I, I won't for time's sake. But Walther definitely uses um, uh, very picturesque language quite frequently. And finally, uh, Walther's use of classic sources. Uh, again, I'll, I'll go over that very quickly and just say here, I'm really talking about what Walther does with things like 
Luther and the Confessions. If you know Walther's writings in Law and Gospel or Church and Ministry, he uses Luther and the Confessions and also other Orthodox theologians extensively. Surprisingly, perhaps, he does that occasionally in his sermons, like about um, about 15% of his sermons quote Luther, and fewer than that quote the Confessions, in the sample I took, that is. Um, and I think the reason is this. Um, in church and ministry, in law and gospel, Walther uses those other sources, the Confessions, Luther, and so on, to build a case to demonstrate why we believe that this interpretation of Scripture is correct. In his preaching, his objective is not to build a case. It's, remember that 45-minute proclamation of law and gospel within a liturgical context? In his sermons, he's just announcing, with Scripture being all the proof he's going to use, just announces this is what God's Word declares to us, period. The proclamation is the emphasis, and that changes the source work that he um, calls upon. Okay, now, everything we've done so far it brings us to the summary of this idea that Walther is a classic Lutheran preacher. And at this point in his sermon, Walther would pause and bring us to that kind of summary. Okay, for the six uh, reasons we've, we've cited, we could contend that Walther is a classic Lutheran preacher. Now, I admit, a lot of those are observations only a homiletician could love. And I'm a homiletician. But the rest of what we cover today is something that all of us should love dearly, as Luther himself would underscore for us when he says, Distinguishing between the law and the gospel is the highest art in Christendom, and one that every person who values the name Christian ought to recognize, know, and possess. Note, law and gospel is the essence of what every Christian's faith is really is. If a person is a believer in Christ, a member of the invisible or hidden church, then he is one who divides law and gospel in his heart. He believes that he is a sinner deserving damnation, and he believes that by Christ's death and resurrection he's been forgiven of all that. Well, obviously, Walther wrote the book on this, so we would certainly hope that Walther, uh, in his preaching, does a fine job of dividing law and gospel. So we hope to contend that Walther is a Lutheran preacher of law and gospel. Um, so how does he do? Walther was pretty smart because he didn't do the lectures on law and gospel until 1884, 1885. That means he finished it less than a year and a half before he died, which means that his hearers couldn't be holding the book and saying, hmm, how'd you do on Thesis 9? Not bad, Walther, you know? Uh, we can do that now, and when we do it, we'd say, I'd say, nobody's perfect, but pretty good. Let me look, take you through several of those six that we have as time permits. The first of the uh, law gospel issues to raise, Walther's preaching of law and gospel, full sternness of the law. Um, thesis six, which is one of the ones I tell my students they should know by number, is this. The word of God is not rightly divided when the law is not preached in its full sternness. And he goes on to say, and the gospel not its full sweetness, okay? For the moment, uh, the law in its full sternness. Well, let me just tell you that, that, that Walther is, is, is very capable of letting him have it with the law. Um, for example, um, in uh, uh, this sermon. Now, if we examine ourselves about this, what do we find? This is on uh, the Good Samaritan. Oh, hearer, do you wander through the world as a Good Samaritan? Or do you still, like the priest and the Levite, pass by your neighbor and live for yourself? Have you already poured your oil and wine in the wounds of your brother? Yes, of your enemy? Or have you always thought only of yourself and your desire? The way you answer will speak the verdict either of life or death. If you find yourself without true love to your brothers, ah, then it is time that you repent, for then you are still in death. 
And with your cold, self-seeking heart, you will never see life. Yes, if you perhaps have to say to yourself that you not only pass by your brother, but are often yourself his tormentor, that you not only pour no oil or wine into his wounds, but that you inflict wounds by hurting his feelings, by slander, by fraud, and things that like that, Ah, then be afraid for yourself, for God's word says, anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Therefore, although you have not attacked anyone with murderous intent, God nevertheless calls to you in the words of the prophet, your hands are full of blood, namely, full of the blood of your brother, whom you hate in your heart. Ah, repent! of your blood-red guilt. Thus far the law. And, uh, and, and by the way, I think he probably preached that very up-tempo, which means to get down to 100 words per minute, which is very patient, there was probably next a long, long pause. Um, Walther is uh, also very direct, and I'll skip these for time's sake, but he's very direct in his preaching of the law against false teachings, uh, against the Roman Church, uh, against the Reformed on uh, the Lord's Supper, and also against uh, other false teachings, uh, like, for example, going back to Arius and, uh, and enthusiasm uh, as well. Um, we would certainly contend that this is prescriptive for what really makes a Lutheran preacher of law and gospel. As Walther says himself, unless the law is preached in its full sternness, what? The gospel can't be heard as fully sweet. Exactly. Yep. Which, of course, brings us to that very important next section, Walther's preaching of law and gospel, general predominance of the gospel. Walther's last thesis, and, the, and you know, there's, it's all a discussion as to whether Walther intended 25 theses over 39 lectures or you know, how, how much he made up on the fly as he went. There's no question he intended the last thesis, number 25, to be this. He says, in the final, final place, the word of God is not rightly divided when the person teaching it does not allow the gospel to have a general predominance in his preaching. Um, Walther was very clear that the law was always only preparatory and the gospel was always God's final word. If it was to be good law gospel preaching, the gospel had to win out. At a, at a very minimum, very minimum, he says in, verse, in uh, developing his lecture on, on uh, Thesis 25, he says, and I think every Lutheran pastor has been told this, and, and this is one I have told you guys you should get right 3,000 out of 3,000 times, okay? Now remember, if you come out of your pulpit without having preached enough gospel to save some poor sinner who may have come to church for the first time and the last time, his blood will be required of you. Which of course is to say that the, the blood of Christ, the death of Christ, the cross of Christ, needs to be explicit in every single sermon. Now, this is one where Walther is going out of limb because I tell my students 3,000 out of 3,000. Out of the 25 I checked for this, what do you guess? 22. <laughs> There were three where I would really say you couldn't know the atoning event from this. And this is where I'd say, you know, it ain't perfect. But it's really very, very good. Sunday after Sunday. Hear this. And what did God do? Walther asks. O oh, wisdom surpassing all wisdom, O oh, love surpassing all love, O oh, wonder surpassing all wonders, listen and marvel. He decided to offer up even his beloved only begotten son for all people as the price of our redemption and to place him on the balance scale for our debt. He himself proclaimed his, this wonder of his love even to the first people in paradise and then had it proclaimed thereafter ever anew, century after century, by the holy patriarchs and prophets. And when finally the time was fulfilled, he also marvelously carried out his eternal decree of love. God's son became a man. 
almost 1867 years ago, permitted himself to be charged with all the sins of mankind and permitted himself to be placed under the law. Through his suffering and death, he bore our punishment and through his work fulfilled our obligation and became obedient unto death, yes, to the death on the cross, on which expiring, he at last cried out, it is finished. The great sacrifice for the expiation of all sins was finished. And behold, on the third day after his death, God the Father himself awoke him from the dead, confirming the word of victory of the dying Redeemer and calling to all sinners, yes, it is fulfilled. And so he declared to the whole world righteousness. I am reconciled. You are redeemed. Your debt is paid. And the righteousness that avails before me is one for you. Now this has got to be prescriptive for Lutheran preaching. And really, sermon after sermon after sermon, yes, some exceptions, Walther's beautiful job of declaring the cross clearly and explicitly. What's more, the gospel predominance is a factor of other things like the positioning in the sermon, how dominant certain illustrations and, and images are and so on. That's very subjective. But in my evaluation, uh, with the exceptions I already mentioned, uh, Walther does a beautiful job of seeing that the gospel has a clear predominance in his preaching um, Sunday after Sunday. The next one, we'll be able to cover this. Walther's preaching of law and gospel, assurance in the means of grace. It's actually important to touch on this one because Walther tells us, Justin, do you remember? What does he say is the chief thesis of the 25? Number six. Six is a good one. Number nine, actually. Thesis number nine, the word of God is not rightly divided when sinners who have been struck down and terrified by the law are directed not to the word and the sacraments, but to their own prayers and wrestlings with God in order that they may win their way into a state of grace. In other words, when they are told to keep on praying and struggling until they feel that God has received them into grace. Um, the error that Walther is talking about here is one that was very much a part of pietism, that one would be directed to be sure that he's going to heaven by looking inside himself and seeing that, yes, yes, my, my faith is what it ought to be, or yes, my struggles have been intense enough, or yes, my praying with God is enough, or yes, I feel that I've been saved. And Walther says the clear alternative to that, and this is really the line of demarcation between what, what makes a Lutheran a Lutheran and what makes most other Christians what they are, is the objective assurance of salvation in the means of grace or in something inside ourselves. And Walther is very, very emphatic about this. And he does this very well. For example, uh, in a sermon on Christmas Day, um, he says this, but perhaps you will ask, where are the gates of heaven open through which we should enter? Talks about heaven being open at Christmas. That is easy to answer. Where baptism is administered, where the preaching of the gospel sounds forth, where the sinner is absolved, where the holy meal of reconciliation is celebrated, there, there, heaven is open. Those are the wide open doors of heaven for everyone. This, of course, is uh, absolutely fu fundamental to both Lutheran theology and therefore should also be to Lutheran preaching as well. The last three categories for time's sake, let me just touch on and tell you in essence what we're talking about. Um, Walther's preaching of law and gospel, pastoral concern for the hearer, um, this is actually uh, a, a beautiful example of what I told my students just in, in lecture yesterday. I said, you know, Walther was a great pastor. In his preaching again and again and again, uh, you hear him uh, describing so intimately what uh, what his concern for them is. I'll give you one little quickie on that one. Walther writes this on a day of repentance for its congregation. This is an annual thing where they have a special day to get together. And I guess Garrison Keeler would say this is what Lutherans love to do, you know, beat themselves over a little bit. Well, listen to this. I ask you, you old first members of this congregation, how was it nearly 32 years ago and in the following years with respect to the love of the brethren among us 
How we then were inwardly united like a single family of how much worth to us was even the least member of the congregation over against an unbeliever, even though a respectable man of the world. How eagerly one helped another in his temporal, in his temporal need and difficulty. What zeal there was to bring also others to God's word. And what joy if only one soul was one, even though it was a poor sinner and a, and a woodcutter. How mightily Brother, brotherly admonition was practiced so that it was at, uh, so that as often as a brother wanted to go on wrong ways, immediately many set out to warn and rescue him. Can you see that? Uh, he's been the pastor of this congregation for 30 years. He looks and says, folks, remember how it was. Remember how we loved each other. And that's a beautiful example of the very personal pastoral concern that Walther had for his hearers. And he does that again and again. Uh, Walther's preaching of law and gospel concern for the conversion of the unbeliever. Um, you know, you could think, well, he had a, a, a congregation of all those, those baptized German Lutherans. You know, they're all believers. You know, what does he matter? What does he care about unbelievers? The fact is, and if you, if you read just through law and gospel, to say nothing of the sermons, you see this again and again. Walther always assumed that there were many in his congregation, members of his church, who at this day, this moment, were unbelievers who might indeed be brought again, baptized as infants, now fallen since, brought back again to faith in the next 45 minutes. In these 45 minutes in the pulpit, people out there are going to be turned from the road to hell to the road to heaven. He even talks about how if we could look into their hearts when we're preaching, we'd see that going on all the time. And countless sermons are, are very, very good um, examples of that. Finally, Walther's preaching of law and gospel, gospel motivation of good works. This is probably the toughest job that, that Lutheran preachers have because, of course, we're justified by God's grace alone. We receive through faith alone apart from our works, right? And yet Luther is very emphatic that we must also preach for good works. Um, the challenge that Walther sets forward in Thesis 23 is this. The word of God is not rightly divided when an endeavor is made by means of the commands of the law rather than by the admonitions of the gospel to urge the regenerate to do good. The question isn't whether we preach for good works. The question is how do we seek to motivate good works? And Walther says the proper distinction of law and gospel as regards good works is that those good works, while they're demonstrated, pictured, described by the law, must always be, can only be motivated by the gospel. Because only the gospel creates a heart that doesn't think of itself, but the new man, knowing he already has everything in Christ, now is free to love God and love neighbor. And one of the, the uh, beautiful examples on this one, and uh, um, this one I will read to you, um, is from uh, the sermon that he preached for his daughter's wedding. This will be my last example. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Yes, God, the Holy Spirit, give you peace. That peace which passes all understanding and keeps the hearts and minds in Christ unto eternal life. That peace of the heart which the Savior holds his spiritual supper with a believing soul, of which the bride in the Song of Solomon says, He brought me to the banqueting table, sustained me with raisins, refreshed me with apples. In short, that inner peace by which one tastes and sees that the Lord is good, which is a foretaste of salvation, a little drop of the wine which the Savior will drink new with his own in his Father's kingdom, beginning of eternal life in the valley of death and tears. Yes, my children, and remember, this is his daughter standing right there in front of him with her future husband. I bespeak you this peace as my last blessing. If this rules in your heart, you, my dear son, will have strength to love your wife as Christ loved the church, to rule over her in love and to bear her weaknesses. And you, my daughter, my real daughter, will have strength not only to love your husband as your Lord, but also to honor and to fear him and to be obedient to him in all things. And your marriage will be a happy, blessed marriage, a lovely picture of Christ's marriage to the church, his eternal bride. And when finally your hour comes, you will fall asleep in peace, to awake where there is are mansions of eternal peace. The point is, there are good works to be done in your marriage, but how do you motivate them? By the magnificent assurance that in Christ Jesus, we already have his perfect peace. And moved by that, 
the good works flow. Well, unlike his uh, sermon introductions, Walther did not have a, a common form for his conclusions. Uh, sometimes in his conclusions, he would simply give a, a summary of what he had said, and obviously we would contend that based on what we have seen, C.F.W. Walther is a classic Lutheran preacher of law and gospel, both as a classic Lutheran preacher and as a Lutheran preacher of law and gospel. Sometimes Walther would conclude his sermons with an exhortation. And I would definitely exhort everybody who's in charge of this thing to keep on doing this. This is a magnificent tradition. It's a delight to, to get to be a, a part of this. Never would Walther conclude his sermons by thanking his hearers. But I will. Thank you very much. And he would always conclude with, Amen. Amen.